tonight's talk is about my favorite thing about the month of May, warblers. And I apologize that 99% of the warbler pictures I've taken over the years have been Eastern warblers, but I am making sure all the regular warblers of North America are in this program. The warbler family, Perulidae, probably originated in Central America and radiated from there. Most warblers uh, winter there and um, they probably just started wandering because there was too much competition for food during the nesting season and, or something like that. And some of them wandered and they found really good places for lots and lots and lots of bugs in uh, North America. And uh, the Perulidae has two sister families. One is Icteridae, the blackbird family. And blackbirds are not just grackles and red-winged blackbirds. They include bobolinks and all the orioles. And those are a sister family to um, the, the warblers. And the other sister family has almost the exact same name as Icteridae. You just throw in one extra I, and it's Icteriidae. And that is the family where they now have uh, the yellow-breasted chat. They took that out. It is no longer a warbler. And there's another warbler that's not only no longer a warbler, but is no longer um, even in a sister species, that is the olive warbler that you can see down in southeastern Arizona. And that one is no longer even related. When I, work, uh, when I started birding, a lot of things have changed since 1975. But uh, this I had, this was a dream of mine to make a real tree. Uh, when we're, we talk about, uh, you know, the evolutionary tree and branches and stuff, and I wanted to illustrate it that way. All these branches are the way it was uh, that taxonomists believed in 2009 when we designed this, when I was uh, the editor at the Cornell Lab. It's all different now. The Perula and tropical Perula were in the genus Perula. And that genus, that was the type specimen of all warblers was the Northern Perula. And so that's what, how the warbler family got named Perulidae. But now they're not in Perula anymore. They put them in with all these other ones, it, it, only not in Dendroica. All these warblers belonged to a genus called Dendroica, and that comes from their birds of the trees. But they've taken, uh, they decided there was one, uh, the first, um, uh, the American Red Star, we're, uh, here's the American, oop, I went the wrong way. Uh, the American red star was in its own genus because it has rictal bristles, little uh, uh, stiff feathers that uh, look almost like whiskers sticking out on, on either side of its mouth. So they didn't have that in the same genus with all the rest, but that one was um, named before any of the dendroicas. So when they decided that the American Red Star DNA was too close to the others and they all belonged to the same genus, they couldn't just move the American Red Star in with all the others. Since it was named first, they moved all the others into Cetophaga, uh, which doesn't make any sense at all except following the taxonomic rules that give priority to the first one that someone published its official name. So um, that was uh, a really strange thing. So none of these have the same names anymore except the American Red Start. Uh, back then, they also uh, kept these all in their um, uh, they put together this Rosetta stone using the same illustrations, but adding the main 
uh, spectrograph of their main song. And uh, they called that their Rosetta Stone. And that, again, is totally outdated now. It's very disappointing that the things I thought were the most creative during my time at the Cornell Lab turned out to be outdated less than a decade later. But I started out looking at warblers. This is Christmas 1976, and I'm wearing exactly the outfit that in one of the new Bob Newhart shows, Suzanne Plachette wore, the same long skirt and skinny blouse, and, and even I think, uh, I, I never realized this until I was looking at reruns of it with my mother-in-law when she was living with us and I freaked out because I have that outfit. But uh, I got my very first pair of binoculars that Christmas of 1974 and my first field guide. And I fell in love with the wood warblers. Now, when I did a big year, in 2013, I decided one of my goals was to see every bird on these two pages. Well, except for Bachman's warbler because it was extinct. Um, and except for Brewster's warbler wouldn't count as a species because it's not a species, it's a hybrid between the golden winged and the blue winged warblers. So that wouldn't count. I did actually manage to see one by Big Ear, but it didn't count toward my list. And Olive Warbler, I also did see, and it did count, but not as a warbler anymore because they pulled that one out. So uh, that was my goal. So I, I started bird watching. I went out on March 2nd and in April, I discovered warblers and it just happened to be Mother's Day, May 11th, 1975, that I went out and saw my first warbler, the black and white, my second warbler, the Nashville, my third warbler, the Magnolia, and my fourth warbler, the black-throated green. And two days later on May 13th, I got I ended up with five warblers for my first spring. I'm missing the most abundant warbler, the, the yellow rumped warbler. And that's because to count any of these birds, I had to see every field mark that the field guide mentioned while the bird was right there. And uh, I was rifling through pages and going crazy. I'm lucky I identified five but I was thrilled with that. But over the years, so many people have talked to me about how tricky, how scared they are of trying to identify warblers, how frustrating it is. So I've come up with some basic rules of warbler identification. The first rule, don't panic. Uh, this is from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, just, it's supposed to be fun, so let it be. The second rule, learn a few common warblers first. So in my case, that would be the uh, yellow rump. And the reason that is so common, they have started going to bird feeders. I took this picture back um, around 2000, I think it was, or 2000 four or five, and uh, it was a, there was one already coming to a feeder. It was picking up the little bits of suet that had dropped from a suet cage on the window. Uh, but now they come to feeders. This one, um, I took my mother-in-law to her card club at a friend's house in Port Wing, Wisconsin. And every fall, this is a fall picture, and these cluster flies fly uh, they get caught in people's windows. And there were a whole bunch of them on the inside of this house's patio window. And this warbler was pecking at the window trying to get them. So I got a fly swatter, was swatting them and putting out a small handful out there and it would eat them and then stare at me, wanting me to deliver some more. And uh, when I was a rehabber, I discovered how adaptable and intelligent warblers are. When you think about it, this little warbler 
may have come from Port Wing, but it may have come from Northern Canada. And it was going to the Southern states. Some of these warblers are going all the way to Central America. A few are going to South America. And many of them started out way up in Canada. And so they can't get, they can't just say, beam me up, Scotty, and get from one place to the other. They have to fly on their own power, fueled by insects. And they have to go over a whole lot of totally inappropriate habitat. They have to go, many of them that follow shorelines end up in Chicago. Many of them that don't follow shorelines end up over a cornfield in Iowa after a long journey. They come down in the morning, they're exhausted, and they have to figure out quick how to get food or they're going to die. So when they, this one quickly figured out that there was this large being behind this weird uh, see-through thing who was swatting flies and giving them to it. And that was very rewarding for me and the warbler found it pretty tasty. But they uh, come now to, these are at my peanut butter feeder. These are at my suet feeder. And I took this, um, I think in the fall of 2019. And they just come and pig out now. They figured out suet. And it's uh, pretty, pretty cool. And they, they jostle. And I try to have enough suet. I do have problems because of my starlings. I don't have many starlings, but they are very rude, obviously. So I have to be careful. So sometimes I run out like a banshee when I see the starlings there. But there are also yellow rumps in the West. And when we get to yellow rumps, we're going to find out something cool about them. So those of you who've seen both the Eastern and the Western will eventually have a new bird on their life list without even going birding. My third rule of warbler identification, don't get fixated on field marks. I just told you about the yellow rump warbler. They have a yellow rump. But this isn't a yellow rumped warbler. It's a Nashville warbler. This isn't a yellow rumped warbler. It's a Cape May. This poor dead one that hit a window at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is not a yellow rump. It's a Magnolia. This is a yellow rump, but it doesn't look like one because it's got a barren plumage. It's a leucistic yellow rumped warbler, meaning it's paler than it should be. Its body isn't making the proper amounts of melanin, the pigment they need. But also the yellow is very washed out on it. So if you get fixated on field marks, um, you, you can get confused. Uh, sometimes it'll be a bird uh, like this weird warbler. It's a hybrid. It's not even a hybrid between a blue winged and a golden winged warbler. It's a back cross. Uh, one parrot was a hybrid between those two species. The other parrot was probably a pure golden winged warbler. And this was the result. And it was a stunningly beautiful bird. Uh, the, the, this is from the old Audubon a uh, land bird guide, and they showed the blue winged and the golden winged warbler. And this is, was the only field guide back when I began that also showed the Brewster type and the Lawrence type hybrid. And my bird didn't match any of those. So it is, um, if you get too fixated, you're going to miss a lot. The fourth rule of warbler identification is don't ignore field marks. They're very helpful. Uh, this is a Nashville warbler. It's got an eye ring, a yellow throat, and no wing bars. And those three things are very important. That's the three things you put together to tell, oh, a Nashville warbler. Eye ring, yellow throat, and no wing bars. They also have a rusty cap, at least the adult males do, but it's like a ruby crown, kinglet's uh, ruby crown. They only expose it 
when they feel like exposing it. I had to see that to identify my uh, lifer Nashville warbler on May 11th, 1975, because I saw that in the field guide. And I was lucky that my lifer showed that to me because I did not see it again for at least 25 years. So I was very lucky I got to add the Nashville warbler to my life list. The Connecticut warbler has an eye ring and no wing bars, but it has a gray throat. The morning warbler has a gray throat, but the males also have black in this chest area in the spring. They don't have an eye ring and they don't have wing bars. But the females and the birds in fall can have an eye ring and still be a morning warbler and not a Connecticut warbler. Uh, Blackbirdian warblers, besides that stunning orange that this picture does not do justice to, they also have a big white wing patch, not simple wing bars, but a whole patch. And so does the Magnolia warbler and the Cape May warbler. And um, the Magnolia warbler also has that beautiful necklace and another warbler has that same necklace, the Canada warbler. And uh, the difference is uh, these two birds are being banded. This is a picture I took at the biggest week in uh, birding in Ohio a few years ago. They, were, they had both birds at once. So you can see they both have the necklace. The Magnolia warbler's decorations around the eye are white where these guys are yellow. And this guy has no wing bars, and this guy has that big chunky wing bar. And so um, you have to know your field marks, but you can't get fixated on them. The fifth rule of warbler identification is read your field guide. Just keep it in the bathroom next to your bed where you drink your coffee in the morning, somewhere where you can look through it fairly often. Uh, that's how you're going to learn a whole lot about warblers, and some of it will sink in if you just keep thumbing through and looking at it. Some field guides are more entry level than others. This little person seems to think this is the greatest field guide ever written, but it's the only one he's ever literally tasted. So, um, but and my guide was meant to be very entry level and straightforward and covering things. Some get into much, much more depth. Uh, the warbler guide, this is this humongous guide that is just for warblers. And they have so much information. It is astounding. Uh, it is a great book, but there are several pages for each warbler and it can be overwhelming. I do not recommend starting with this field guide when you're trying to learn warblers. Use a regular field guide and just figure out stuff. And then as you get a handle on which are the warblers and which are the vireos and just start feeling a little bit more confident then you can tackle uh, this amazing resource. They also have it as an app, and it's a really worthwhile one. Read your field guide a lot. You'll find out little hints that when in the rush of the moment, you might not have noticed. Uh, the palm warblers have yellow on above, uh, below their tail, not on their rump, but on their undertail coverts. And they wag their tail up and down very, very constantly. That is such a cool mark. And when you know just those two things, because they're extremely variable in plumage, but they all have yellow undertail coverts and they all wag their tail. And that will really help your field guide will also say they spend a lot of time on the ground, on fences and on roofs. 
probably more than any other warbler, this is the one you'll see on fences, on the ground, and on a roof. My sixth rule of warbler identification is to learn a few easy warbler songs. And I haven't yet figured out how to use their vocalizations on my Zoom program um, because I have to use a headset. So, um, so I don't have the recordings for you here. Uh, you can hear any bird's recordings for free at Cornell's um, their All About Birds website. If you go to my website and look up any species, it will have the link for that species to Cornell's All About Birds, as well as other stuff. But the black-throated green warbler has a very distinctive z z zoo zoo z or z z z zoo z call. And when you know that is their song, it's an easy one to pick out. The oven birds can be easy to pick out. It's a teacher, 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 teacher. It gets louder. Uh, it's a, a really cool crescendo. And this song is really important to learn because oven birds are skulkers, very difficult to see. So they are much more often heard than seen. The morning warbler, uh, the ones I have here sing cheese, cheese for me, for me. And uh, ever since I came up with that mnemonic when I was um, back in the early 80s, when I was spending a lot of time birding in Port Wing, Wisconsin, and figured that mnemonic out, that the morning warbler became very easy. But it wasn't until I had something that my brain could hear when I heard the bird. The common yellow throat is another one that has a distinctive song. It's witchity, 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 witch, or looky here, looky here, looky here. And um, when you know the song, you'll pick out the birds much more easily. The pine warbler sounds like a chipping sparrow, a junco, and a worm eating warbler. It has a trill. And when I was a little girl, and you have to be my age or older, and many people my age weren't watching TV because I think the show went off the air in like 1954 or 55. But there was a show called My Little Margie. And every time she got in trouble, she looked directly at the camera and went, Drrr. And these birds are the My Little Margie birds to me. They have this drrr. Pine warblers is a little sweeter, a little bit more musical than the chipping sparrows. Uh, the worm eating warblers is drier and faster. Uh, the juncos is a little bit shorter and kind of musical, but a mechanical musical. And um, when you pick them out, little by little, you get good at telling them apart, but never get too confident. I've noticed that in uh, a small area, if there's both chipping sparrows and pine warblers, that um, they each take on some song characteristics of the other species. So that makes it even harder, which is not fair, but it's the way they are. I love yellow warblers. They, their one song is sweet, sweet, aren't I sweet? Uh, they also have a song that is very, very confusing because it sounds like a chestnut-sided warbler's please, please, please to meet you, or I'm here to miss, meet Miss Beecher. Um, and so learn the basic one first, the one that will separate this from any bird. Uh, but their songs are confusing, so it's going to take time and patience. When you hear unfamiliar songs, check them out. And when you hear familiar songs, verify that that's who you think it is. The seventh rule of warbler identification is to set up ground level bird baths. You won't just get pileated woodpeckers coming to them. I love that picture because how often does a pileated woodpecker come to your bird bath? But uh, this is a yellow rumped warbler at mine. 
and they're just so fun to watch. Uh, I, I have my nest, uh, my trail cam. It was what took that uh, that movie, but these are all at bird baths of mine or friends of mine or at Hog Island Audubon's camp on in Maine. Uh, this was Blackburnian, Black Throated Green, Northern Perula. But the eighth rule is: if you have a camera, use it. And it doesn't matter if your pictures are crappy. This is the only picture of a hermit warbler I got on my big year. I treasure that picture, even though it's crappy. Um, this is a red-faced warbler. It's not a very good picture, and it's pretty uh, tightly cropped just to get that. Um, my only pictures of McGillivray's warblers are from when I took the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's field recording class in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California, and they had banding every day, so we got to, that was my only picture ever of McGillivray's warbler. And my eighth rule, uh, it has a corollary that you get trail cams and set them up near your feeders and your bird baths, uh, near any uh, potential chickadee nest. Uh, this is a picture from mine. You can see four different species uh, or three different species. You can see the, the purple finches, you can see the yellow rump warbler, you can see the chickadee, um, and you don't miss anything when you have a trail cam. The ninth rule is pay attention to chickadees. And why does that matter if you want to learn your warblers? These warblers are strangers in a strange land when they're crossing America to get from Central America to, Can uh, to Canada. And the one thing they're familiar with from their the year they hatched and any other uh, summers they've been up in Canada, that they know chickadee calls. And chickadees welcome everybody into their flock except birds that might eat them. And so the warblers can gravitate to the chickadees. That's how they find out where the danger is, where the good sources of water are, where the best uh, sources of insects are, they gravitate to warblers. When I was a mother, my daughter was allergic to mosquitoes. And when, when the kids were tiny, it would be frustrating during spring migration. But when the chickadees came to my feeder, because they come, you know, just several times a day each flock, but then they're gone. When they came, I knew that was the time to run out in the yard and check out the trees to see if there were warblers there. Uh, chickadees are amazing for that. Um, when you hear chickadees, scan the trees because you're going to see more than chickadees during migration. I always think of them because these poor little birds are tempest tossed. Um, uh, you know, uh, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free. They go to their little statue of liberty to rescue them. And my 10th rule of warbler identification is have fun. And don't forget, don't panic. So now I'm gonna go through all the warblers and we don't have a lot of time for as many species as there are. The oven bird, uh, its scientific name hasn't changed. It's Siurus orocapilla. Uh, it's got a golden uh, head, uh, a little crown that you don't always see. You have to be in the right angle. It's, outlined by this dark, dark brown, and then this is orangey. And they're very beautiful. And, and when you find one, you can just watch it. Uh, they'll be extremely cooperative once you figure out where the heck they are. They don't do a whole lot of moving in between their songs. So if you're just very patient, you don't need to play recordings. Just when you hear an oven bird singing, try to find it. They tend to be on fairly thick, fairly horizontal branches. And they're, 
one of, they're just lovely. Oven birds have the tragic distinction of being one of the most commonly found dead birds under windows and under lighted towers. Uh, they, uh, they crash into the upper windows of skyscrapers and into towers with flashing lights at nighttime, but they also crash into people's house windows in the daytime. And this is not a feeder bird. Uh, you're not attracting it. It's just there and they hit windows for some tragic, un, un, understandable reason. But they are so wonderful when you see them in the woods. So they're really worth searching for. And this one's violating the rule about horizontal branches because they're functionally illiterate. They're an Eastern warbler that gets over into uh, Western Canada, uh, Central Western Canada. Um, this is their breeding grounds is the blue and they winter, some winter in Florida, but most of them go further south. The worm eating warbler uh, does eat on the ground a lot of things. They're a lovely little bird, but I hardly ever have gotten to see them. They're much more southerly, though we have had uh, several records. Some used to breed in Wisconsin in a cool place called Baxter's Hollow, which is property that belo uh, belongs to the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology. But they have these cool stripes on their head. They're very muted in their colors, sort of the color of an earthworm. They have a very small eastern, southeastern breeding range. And here's where they winter. Most of them are Central America, Mexico, um, the Caribbean islands, and, and what we think of as Central America. The water thrushes have this cool bobbing motion. We, um, and the word water thrush is one word. They're not a thrush. Water thrush is a kind of warbler. And they were moved into a different genus, Parkesia. And uh, they spend a lot of time in the water and near the water and have really cool songs. Uh, the Louisiana water thrush is the further south one. The northern water thrush is the one that I get in my backyard every spring. I have no idea why, but there's always one in the back of my yard that will sing for several days. And there, and these are at my mother-in-law's place by her bird feeder in Port Wing, and they never went to the feeder, but I got pictures there every year. But they're a pretty cool bird, and they have the, the the orange is where they breed, the yellow is where they migrate, and the blue is where they winter. Bachman's warbler is extinct. Uh, this is one of the very last photographs ever taken of a Bachman's warbler in 1958. And if you go to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's All About Birds page, you can actually hear a recording that was made while they still lived. But the last reliable sightings of them that are universally accepted ended in uh, the 1960s. These are birds that needed cane breaks. Uh, here's where they used to live. And um, their habitat was just destroyed. They weren't like persecuted in the way that passenger pigeons and um, uh, Carolina parakeets were, but we destroyed all their habitat. But they winter, wintered in Cuba. The golden-winged warbler is just so beautiful, and they breed uh, the uh, the the vast majority of still living ones is in Wisconsin and Minnesota. We're sort of the epicenter of their breeding grounds now. Uh, they're just beautiful little birds. This is uh, the one that was the parent, one of, you know, a uh, golden winged of that hybrid I showed earlier. Uh, they, you can see why they're called golden winged warblers. They have that big patch of gold on the males. 
and they have uh, if you're looking at them from underneath looking up they look very much like a black cap chickadee because you see this and if they're looking uh from the right angle you see this white and then you see the black and this almost looks wide enough to be a whole cheek at the at the right angle so you have to be careful uh not to overlook one as a chickadee if you see it just momentarily but they're stunningly beautiful birds they have a very high pitched song that i can no longer hear except with serious help but and the females are uh, duller, but they have that golden patch. And I took this in Port Wing with our co-host, Paula, uh, on Big Pete Road, uh, one of the places we went birding together. But these guys, what has happened to them uh, is they were the northern species and a very closely related species, the blue-winged warbler, has genetically swamped them out. Uh, so their population has really dropped between uh, the 70s when we started taking breeding bird survey data and now. Here's the blue-winged warbler. I heard one singing out my bedroom window a couple of years ago, and I was actually a little bit thrilled because it was a new yard bird, but it was also um, kind of a tragic sound because I knew that when they start breeding here, they're going to start taking over and we're going to lose golden winged warblers. But they're beautiful little warblers. And their wing is sort of blue, I guess. <laughs> That's what they're named for. <laughs> and they're just really pretty birds. And their range is little by little creeping northward where it's going to swamp out the golden wings. The black and white warbler is uh, the only one in Nilotilta, uh, that genus. They're just beautiful birds that totally live up to their name, just black and white. And they have these cool little chevrons under their tail and if you see that if you're at a bad angle looking up and all you see is that tail you know that's a black and white warbler by those little markings and they all have it and it's really cool and they uh, have a habit of feeding on large limbs and even the trunks of trees very much like nut hatches or creepers. So you see them going up or down and uh, they're picking out little bugs in the crevices of the bark. And they're really, really well adapted to that. Uh, this one had just been banded. So it's got a band on its leg and it hit a window on the Lake Superior, um, the Northern Lake uh, visitor center in Ashland, Wisconsin, and it was fine. It just sat there for a while. But uh, this picture is used by a lot of organizations when they're talking about birds hitting windows. So, um, but they breed, uh, they have a pretty southern as well as northern breeding range. So, um, but all eastern until you get up here. Prothonotary warbler, no one really knows why they're called that. Uh, the pro, the prothonotary in the Roman Catholic Church is a papal notary. Proto notaria means first notary or secretary or accountant type thing. And except uh, I read when I started birding that they got the name because uh, the prothonotaries of the church had these lemon yellow uh, vestments that they, uh, their religious garb, but it turns out they don't wear that color and never have. So I have no idea how they got their name and nobody seems to be able to find out the truth. But they're wonderful, beautiful little birds and they're one of only two warblers that nest in cavities. 
Uh, and so they sometimes nest in bird houses. Uh, they eat a lot of bugs and they know how to get them out of spider webs, which is pretty cool. But they nest in, um, in the wild away from people in cavities, in swamps. But they also nest in bird houses. I got this picture when I was at the birding festival in uh, the Indiana Dunes. That was a fantastic birding festival, by the way. Uh, but also one of my friends, uh, his family has a cabin near the Mississippi River near Trempeleau, Wisconsin. And in 2006, he told me about a prothonotary uh, warbler pair that had been nesting in this tea kettle for several years. So I went over there to see, and here were the eggs. And then the eggs hatched into little chicks and the little chicks turned into bigger chicks. And uh, Scott Lee got all these pictures of the birds year after year because they were nesting in that tea kettle. And the cool thing was with the overhang, there was no rain that got into it and the birds were protected because nest predators don't usually expect to see prothonotary warbler babies on the door of a cabin. And people were going in and out that door all the time. But this is a kind of, um, it doesn't get too far north. It follows uh, large rivers. This is one you can't miss if you go to uh, either the Indiana Dunes Birding Festival or the Biggest Week Festival. Uh, also, if you go to the Red Slough Birding Festival in southeastern Oklahoma, uh, they nest there too. So that was a, a highlight of that's my birding festival bird. The Swainson's warbler is another bird of cane breaks and things. Uh, I got my, um, my photos and I also got a really good recording, but just with my cell phone of this bird. When I was at the Red, um, Red Slough Birding Festival in southeastern Arizona, uh, southeastern Oklahoma. That is a fantastic, really cool, intimate birding festival. And Mia Revels, one of the world authorities on the species, took each group out to see a Swainson's warbler. She took each group to see a different Swainson's warbler. She got everybody focused where the bird was gonna come. She played one recording and that was that. And everybody had to pay attention because the bird would come and sing and I got my recording and then it left. And that was the only time she bothered that one all season. She knows her individual birds and was so responsible as a guide. This is one as secretive as the oven bird, really hard to see. And, but she knows how to get you to see them without doing too much disturbance of the birds. Nobody knows why there's all these extra limital records for this bird, but they're a sort of Southeastern bird and they winter down here. The Tennessee warbler is another one without wing bars, and it's got kind of a gray head, a greenish back, kind of a, a yellowish greenish rump. This one's being banded, and it's one that came to my cherry tree, the one that the chickadees may or may not still be nesting in. And every year I could get pictures of them. They weren't eating the cherries, but they were eating insects in the tree. They nest very far north, though uh, some of us luck into them uh, near Lake Superior and in northeastern Minnesota, but they're almost all Canada. And in Maine, they get to see them too. Orange crown warbler. Uh, this my daughter holding one back when I was a rehabber. This one hit 
a building in downtown Duluth and um, ended up at our my little rehab clinic for a couple days. I had just a sprained wing. That's when I figured out how adaptable warblers are though, because just within 10 minutes of being there, they would take mealworms out of your hand. And it wasn't like they became tame. They just figured where I am right now, this is how you, the way you get food. And they figured that out very readily. Orange crowns are more of a Western warbler. They pass through in the East, but they, um, breed further north except in the west. So Kalima warbler, I do not have a photo of. I saw it on my big ear. Um, and I saw it in the same place where I saw a mountain lion and I was all by myself about six miles from the nearest building and I hadn't seen any people and I was out of cell phone service. But fortunately, the, neither the Kalima warbler nor the mountain lion were interested in me. And um, the only place you can see them in the United States, here actually is a picture uh, that was, is in Creative Commons. So uh, you, we have permission to use it from Wikipedia. Uh, and the only place in the United States where you can find them is in Big Bend National Park. They're mainly found in Texas, I mean, in Mexico. Lucy's warbler, I saw my lifer back in 1982 in Arizona, but that was before I was taking pictures. And I saw one um, briefly on my big ear, but I didn't get a picture. But that's the other warbler that nests in cavities. And this picture again is from Wikipedia of one nesting in a cactus. Uh, this is its nest site. And you can find them in Arizona right now. Or in southwestern New Mexico. Nashville warbler. Uh, is that one I showed you before with the eye ring and the yellow throat and the lack of wing bars. And they're a pretty little bird and they have that rusty cap though they very seldom show it unless they're bathing apparently. And they would come to our cherry tree for insects. And they're also one of the birds that comes very frequently to my bird bath. And they're just a really handsome little bird. And they breed abundantly here. My breeding bird survey, uh, when I was doing that back when I could still hear all the high frequency warblers, I uh, usually had one of the, um, the largest numbers of Nashville warblers on my route of any route. So that was kind of cool. Virginia's warbler is a Western one. I got my only pictures of it during my big year in New Mexico, uh, not too far from Bosque de la Pache in a nice little national uh, forest area that was up in the mountains. But uh, my pictures are pretty lousy, but that's a Western warbler. Connecticut warbler is one that a lot of people come to Duluth to see every year. They nest in the Saxon bog. They have the eye ring and the gray throat and no wing bars. And they have a very, very, very loud song. Uh, easy, I've heard it several times since we lived here in the city in Duluth in my yard in spring. Uh, but not very often in the past decade or two. Not a lot is known about them, but Don Krutzma has been studying them and finding uh, really interesting song patterns for them. So um, it's going to be interesting finding out what he finds out. 
Here's a West, the Western counterpart of the morning warbler is McGillivray's warbler. And my only picture is of a banded bird, but they are fairly common in the West. And I saw that on my, on my, um, big year when I was with my friend Eric Bowman. I think we were uh, outside Yosemite in September when I got my only McGillivray's warbler of the year. And it's a true western warbler. The morning warbler I really love because they, they're very secretive, very hard to find, but I have sort of an affinity for them. So I've been lucky to figure out how to recognize their song and then to figure out how to find them skulking around. So I am very partial to them. I think field guide should make a bigger emphasis to this black chest mark that the males have during the breeding season. It's really spectacular. But they do a lot of their searching for food on the ground. And I believe they nest on the ground and they sing from the treetops a lot. So that's a little interesting. But they're just beautiful little birds. And they breed, they winter all the way down in like Panama and then in South America, Northern South America. The Kentucky warbler, I have very poor pictures of, but I don't even care because I think it's just a beautiful bird. And um, they're a little south. Uh, we don't have a lot of uh, them in Minnesota. Um, they're a little more likely in Wisconsin, but they're more in the southeast. And uh, then they go all the way down to Central America. The common yellow throat is now put in the same genus with the morning warbler and the Kentucky warbler. They um, used to be in different genera. But yellow throats are kind of interesting. You find them in cattail marshes and you find them in um, brushy fields. Uh, they're not a woodland warbler in the way that most of our warblers are. And notice I say this right before I show you a picture of one in the woods. But they sing that witchety, 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 or looky here, looky here, looky here. There's a young male. And they're found in the east and the west, not in the southwest. They are a little bit more into um, moister areas. And then this is my only picture of a hooded warbler. I got this picture at the biggest week birding festival, uh, but that's a southeastern warbler. I actually got my lifer hooded warbler and Kentucky warbler back in 1980 in the Smoky Mountains, and they were both singing from the same power line. It was really cool. The American Red Star is the one that was Cetophaga, and then all the other ones suddenly were put in the same genus with it. Do you see the little bristles on the outside of its mouth? That was the feature that put it in a different genus than the others. But the adult males that are two years old, not the ones this year, when you see one like this in May and the beginning of June, if it's black and orange, it was not hatched in 2020. It was hatched in 2019 or earlier. It takes the males two years to get this gorgeous plumage at the beginning of the breeding season. But those poor young guys, that were hatched in 2020 are still capable of breeding and they want to mate and they sing, but the females ignore them unless they can't find a mature red start. 
birds always want the oldest mate they can get in almost every species. And it doesn't matter if it's a male or female, they both think age equals experience and that's a good thing. But here's a young male, like uh, the ones that look like this, this may will be ones that hatched in 2020. And uh, the females and the young males have yellow instead of orange in the wing and tail. And this is a young male. And this is a grown up male. And they're kind of Eastern, except look, you can get them in some places in the West. So. Kirtland's warbler is one of my favorites. I lived in Michigan in 1976 when they were doing censuses and we're calling this Michigan's bicentennial bird because it was 76 and they wanted to get 200 breeding pairs that year. And it was really dicey. They were critically endangered. They nest on the ground under jack pine trees. And when the jack pine trees get older, they drop their bottom branches, can't shelter the nests, and the Kirtland's warbler can't use them anymore. So um, they, but this is an important conservation success story because now there's many more than there were. We've, uh, they had never historically been exposed to cowbirds and suddenly cowbirds expanded their range into where Kirtland's warblers were. And these guys only breed once a season. So if they lost a significant number of their young because they were raising a cowbird, um, they, they didn't have another chance to reproduce that season. Uh, but they're just these beautiful, beautiful birds. And um, I just got very attached to them because of their, um, because of my Michigan connection, because I'd gone to Michigan State. And uh, I lucked out. First, I got my lifers in Michigan, and I took our kids to see them when our family went out east in 1993. But I also got to see um, one once in Florida, it was at the very end of October uh, in a uh, Lake Kissimmee State Park, I saw one. And I've seen them, I think three times in Ohio at the Biggest Week Festival. Uh, Kirtland's Warbler was originally discovered in Ohio near Cleveland. And it's seen there very often during spring migration. And it was, a, I think a few decades before they realized where the birds were breeding. They never found them breeding until they found them in uh, the jack pine habitat in North Central Michigan. But now they're breeding in Wisconsin and I've also seen them there. I have not seen them in Duluth, even though they're, they come to Duluth too. Well, we've got a race now. Uh, the Cape May Warbler is a specialist. It has a brushier tongue than other warblers and that's to lap up sap um, from yellow-bellied sapsucker drill holes. That's where this one is right now. But they also come to fruit, they come to oranges and they come to grape jelly and um, so during a really cold migration, they'll turn up in my backyard coming to my feeders. And this one actually figured out how to drink from a hummingbird feeder. It could only uh, hover there for a few seconds before it had to land in the tree and then come back, but it was very determined. And they were even sometimes coming to my suet, but they're strikingly beautiful birds. They're tricky in the fall. The females can be very dull, uh, but they're a cool warbler and uh, they're um, pretty far north breeders, but they also breed in the Lake Superior area up here. 
cerulean warbler. My claim to fame is getting a picture of a pooping cerulean warbler. Here's the poop. And not only that, but you could also see the male's cloacal protuberance in this picture. This is double X-rated. And he was standing under the tree at that exact moment and it pooped on his hand. So the poop that you saw coming out of the bird is that poop. He's Kurt Ron, who used to work, he's retired now, but he worked at National Camera in the Twin Cities. And cerulean warblers are um, a spotty and they're declining. They need uh, mature uh, hardwood forests. The Northern Perula up in Northern Minnesota and Wisconsin, they breed in the Usnea lichen or we call it old man's beard that hangs, especially from balsams. But in the Southeast, this exact same species nests in Spanish moss. And so they have two kind of distinct breeding areas where they can get the Spanish moss and then in the Appalachians and they can find old man's beard in these areas, but they need the forest to be pretty moist and clean to furnish either Spanish moss or Usnea lichen. Uh, I took this picture in Cuba of one. The tropical perula photo not available, but I did see them on my big ear down in Texas and they're pretty tricky. Magnolia warbler is, is never found in magnolia trees. I mean, virtually never. It's the worst named bird ever, except the ones named for bad people. But they're just beautiful little birds. And they come to my bird bath a lot. And they breed here. They tend to breed in dense spruce branches. And the bay breast, I've gotten my best pictures of these guys at the biggest week birding festival. In the fall, they're quite dull. And um, they're a pretty cool bird. Blackburnian is one of my favorites. It's named for Anna Blackburn, who gave a lot of money to ornithologists in the early 1800s. And they would send her dead birds to display in her house. Um, I thought Blackburnian met, was because of the flaming, burning orange and the black. But no, <laughs> there was very disillusioning. And they come to my bird bath a lot. And they're uh, both on the Northwoods and the Appalachians for them. And they winter down further south, like in South America. Yellow warblers are uh, east and west birds. And I got these nesting pictures during the biggest week right on the boardwalk. And here's one being banded and they blew on her tummy so you can see her brood patch. This is hot skin that she presses against the eggs. And that's how they grow into little babies. That's what she's doing right there. And they're so beautiful. And they breed over much of the United States and they winter down in Central America. Chestnut sideds are just so pretty and they do a lot of their activities at eye level. So I've seen males and females displaying and mating and being high, highly romantic and working on nests and they are very curious. So just pishing will get them to look at you so you can take their picture. And once I had one come to my bird feeder where I actually took a picture and they can also breed down in the Appalachians, but they're kind of Northeastern. Black pole warblers have the weirdest migration because they go all the way to South America. Usually from the East Coast, they fly over the ocean for much of their flight but they're really, really cool birds. And they're one of our latest arrivals. Uh, when they come, you know, warbler migration's almost over. But they breed north of the United States, except when you get to uh, the Adirondacks and Maine 
And so they were a highlight at, at the Acadia Birding Festival. Black Throat of Blue is one of my favorites. I got this picture. They, uh, they nest right near the boardwalk at the uh, biggest week birding festival, the McGee Marsh. And they are so, so beautiful. And if the light doesn't, uh, if there isn't good light, you see the pigment color instead of the beautiful color. Uh, uh, blue is a structural color and is more brilliant with good light. The females are a dull color, but they have that same little white area that the males have. See how the males have that white area in their wings? The females have that too. And this was in Cuba. And sure enough, that's where they winter. And the palm warbler is the one that's always wagging its tail. And they spend a lot of time on the ground. If you go to Disney World any time between October and March, you're going to see palm warblers all over the ground there. They're one of the birds I take a lot of pictures of at Disney World. Uh, where my son works there, so that's how I find myself there. Pine warbler is the one that has that brrrr kind of call, uh, much higher pitch than that. It's a trill, but they're associated very strongly with pine trees. And um, during migration, they might sometimes come to bird feeders. And they're found in pine forests, whether it's in uh, year round in the southeast and then up here uh, in pine forests during the breeding season. And the yellow rumped warbler, our version, uh, they all have yellow rumps, but they also have yellow on the crown and yellow on right below the wings on the sides. And then the Audubon's version, the Western one has yellow on the throat. And um, here's the Audubon's. And they are going to split them. They haven't yet. And that's because the myrtle warbler, the Eastern one that also comes to the West. So people in the West have seen myrtle warblers, but people in the East don't get a chance to see Audubon's. But there are two different um, yellow rumped warblers that are in Mexico and the Southwest that they haven't figured out genetically yet. So they haven't split it into two species. Ultimately, they're going to split it into three or four species. Yellow throated warbler is different from the common yellow throat, but they're both warblers. And yellow throated warblers are a Southeastern bird. And prairie warbler, this is one of my big treats when I get to visit my son in Florida. Um, they winter in Florida and they breed near the coastal parts of Florida. And then they breed, um, I see most of them during the breeding season along the eastern, the east coast. Uh, Grace's warbler, this is my only picture of that from my big year. That's a southwestern bird, and it's a beautiful one. That uh, There's actually a hybrid of a Grace's and a Blackburnian warbler, I think, some uh, record. And this is a terrible picture of a black-throated gray warbler, which is a beautiful western warbler. They have that little tiny speck of yellow there. Um, which is just so cool. But that's a true Western bird. Townsend's warbler, I got to see a whole lot of, and I took most of these pictures with my friend Eric Bowman during my big year, and they were just everywhere in September. Uh, so fun to watch. And they're a true Western species. And hermit warbler, I got this picture in Arizona when I was at their birding festival in southeastern Arizona in 2019 in the fall. But this is my big year one that I was the last warbler in order to get all the warblers. And that's a true Western warbler just in Washington, Oregon and California for breeding. Golden cheeked is endangered. I saw that in Balcones Canyonlands National Wildlife Refuge. Heidi Trudell told me exactly where to go. And I got there. 
it was 108 degrees. It was late afternoon. And I was afraid this was the only one I was going to see. I did their whole hiking loop and did not see any real birds, just ones painted on the rocks. Then I got back to the parking lot and this was right in front of my car and this one and uh, it was a father. And I don't know if I think this was the adult female, but there were also babies and it was really cool but they're critically endangered. They're only found in the plateau country in Texas to breed. And that is getting a lot of development. So it's pretty scary. Black-throated green is the Eastern one, the ZZ Zuzu Z. And Canada warbler, I talked about a little bit and showed you the banding pictures. That's the one with the necklace and the no wing bars and the eye ring. And they winter in uh, South America. Wilson's warbler, uh, they look like they're wearing a little beanie. But nobody ever calls them beanie babies. And that's one that breeds uh, more in the US and the West than in the East. And then the red-faced warbler, and I have these pictures are all taken in New Mexico um, during my big year, but they are found just in um, New Mexico and Arizona and then down in Mexico. Painted red start. And there's some winter records of them in weird places, but I took these in Southeastern Arizona after a big snowfall in November. And they were perfectly fine eating bugs near buildings and going to jelly feeders. And, and then 44 seconds of Zen. I took this um, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he is perfectly fine. He spent part of the day sitting on their gutter drain pipe and part of the day uh, up in trees. And then he flew away at about eight o'clock that night. And the next morning came back and they people found him because chickadees were swearing at him. They're nice to warblers, but they swear at owls and either way, follow the chickadees. But isn't that cool? Just breathing and, and that's the end. So stay safe and well, and I will answer questions. Sorry, I went over. Yeah, Laura? Yeah? What's the first two rules? I missed it. I got like, what's the first two rules of uh, corporate identification? Don't panic. And, um, and learn the common warblers first, I think. And the other thing too, how are you able to focus it on because they're so, move so quickly in the trees? Uh, with my camera or with your binoculars? Binoculars. Um, okay, uh, get really good practice with street signs or um, just a different, things that hold still and are guaranteed not to move mm -hmm. uh, at getting your eye looking at it and then pulling up your binoculars. And so, so when you pull up your binoculars, because depending on your binoculars, some of them shift at slightly up or slightly down. Uh -huh. And so by doing it often for things that are guaranteed not to move, you will get just automatic. So when you pull them up, you're on the bird. And so, you have to practice with your focus adjustment at focusing on things that don't move too. So, fo so focus doesn't I mean doesn't move and then move it up then. Right. Okay. It's or, tricky. Or and, and practice, you know, just at bird feeders and things where they <laughs> usually stay in the same place. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it just takes a lot of practice. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Nice job as always. 
Oh, thank you. Good night. Uh, uh, somebody asked what state I'm in. Uh, I think we could call it a state of confusion, but Paula answered that I'm in Minnesota. I'm and in Duluth. You, and they saw the next question too. How do you tell when a bird is a warbler? Are there a couple characteristics that all warblers share? Nope. It's so <laughs> tricky. That's why you have to keep thumbing through your field guide a lot. Uh, that's an important rule. Um, that's when you start noticing. I mean, when I started birding, I read my field guide cover to cover. And right off the bat, I saw these ducks. And or, or no, I saw loons and grebes, and they looked like ducks to me. And the ducks were further in the book. And then there were like coots and gallinules that, how would I know which was a duck and which wasn't? And I noticed right off the bat that there was a bird in the middle of the field guide that was slate gray with a white tummy and white outer tail feathers. And I thought, well, that's going to be easy. And then I get close to the end of the book, and there's another slate gray bird with a white tummy and white outer tail feathers. And I thought, holy crap, how am I going to tell these apart? Uh, the black Phoebe, you'd only find in the West. but birds fly. And I didn't know how you could tell a black Phoebe from a Junko. And now, like, there's no way I would confuse them. The beak is totally different. The behavior is totally different. The posture is totally different. But it was bewildering. And every time I saw a bird, I would start page one common loon and rifle through my field guide when I saw a page that looked like it had my bird in it, I'd put my finger, but keep going just in case there were more on another page. And that meant my whole first spring, and I went out every single day, I ended up with a life list of 40. With the warblers, um, you had these brown ones, you know, the, the worm eating and the oven bird. And how do you know that a wren isn't one? When you've seen wrens, you start seeing these little teeny tiny little um, uh, horizontal barring areas on their wings and their tail that make you know what a wren is. And you start noticing how they hold their tail different. But that could be a warbler. Vireos are very confusing at first. And like the Tennessee warbler and the red-eyed vireo look you know, have very similar field marks, the black line through the eye, the pale underside, the greenish back with no wing bars. And so it takes time and practice to integrate all that in your head with the actual birds. It's great to go on bird walks with people who tell you what everything is, but don't get reliant on other people pointing them out because uh, then when you find one in your backyard, you're gonna be more confused, not remembering what things. Try and figure out as many of them on your own too. And like I said, my whole first spring, I went out every day, I searched and searched. And when I saw birds, I kept studying them, even though I'd already seen it before. I paid attention to how robins walk, but I also paid attention to when they flew overhead. And that helped later when I would be like at Hawk Ridge and Duluth, or when I went to Whitefish Point in Michigan, and birds are flying over, you could recognize the robins. You don't necessarily see the rusty underside, but you see the white between the tail and the dark breast and belly. And that stands out. The bluebird has more white. It extends a little further up. And little by little, you pay attention, but it is tricky. There's nothing that tells you this is a warbler and this is a vireo. Uh, the vireo, when you get have practice, you notice that they actually have a little tooth 
at the tip of their beak, which is lethal in a bird banding bag. They can never put a vireo in with warblers because it uses that nasty little tooth when it's stressed out to bite things and uh, the other warblers will end up dead. But you can't say it's easy to tell vireos from warblers in the field until you've seen enough of them. It's like when I was a teacher, the first day of school, I would take pictures of all my students and take them to the one hour film developing place then and make a field guide to my kids. And it took me a while to tell them all apart. And, you know, I had 30 students. You have to learn about 30 warblers wherever you live. And it's tricky. Um, so now I was wondering about how the red starts and perulas are now classified and then how that relates to the general family of warblers and if it's still perulidae. It's still perulidae. It was called that. The perula was the one that named it, but um, perula as a genus is different than perulidae, the family. And um, it's so tricky when I've gone to ornithological meetings, like when the American Ornithologist Union, I've been a member of them since they were the American Ornithologist Union, now they're the American Ornithological Society. But um, you go to the taxonomy sessions and birds don't have little identification things that tell you what they're related to or anything. And so people have to make guesses. And back before they could analyze DNA, they would look at tiny little bones. Uh, they looked at jaw bones. They looked at the bird's syrinx, the place where they make their song. They looked at certain muscles. And if two birds had very similar ones, they figured they were closely related. And if they had different ones, they figured they weren't that closely related. The red star had those bristles, which the other warblers don't. So they thought, well, that's different. That must belong to its own genus, not related to these other guys. And the Perula warblers, I forget which things they thought made them different. But when they got the DNA, that shifted everything. But when I went to taxonomy meetings, they were brutal because there was no simple way you could be sure. There was no teacher with the, with the answer key. Everybody was just making the best guesses they could based on which data they were looking at. And they would be so mean to each other. One person would give a paper about something. I remember one woman gave this wonderful paper. I can't even remember the species now, but she was saying something was more closely related than people had thought. And after her talk, a guy got up and said, you must have written that during that terrible divorce you had because you clearly were not thinking straight. And I mean, who says that? <laughs> it was so bizarre. So um, taxonomy was never something I was interested in. But did that answer your question at all? They just decide, like the name Perulidae was named for the Perula warbler, and they can't take that away. If they found out that warblers and vireos belong to the same family, then whichever one was named first would be the one that kept the name, and the other one would have to join it. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question. And any other questions? Does it look like it? I must have. There's too many warblers to do a, a, in an hour. <laughs> but anyway, I shall say class dismissed. And uh, if you want to hear beautiful evening grosbeak music, they've been in my yard. I've had like 50 all oh. week since Sunday. And it's like when we moved to Duluth in 1981, they were an everyday bird back then. We were going through 
uh, 50 pounds of sunflower seed uh, at least a week, most much of the year back then. And I've been bringing buckets of birds. I only have two feeders that they're coming to, two big tray feeders, but they are there all day and their songs, they just don't shut up. It's really cool. So I have their uh, some recordings already. If you go to lauraerickson.com and, and look up Evening Grow Speak, it'll have recordings that I made in my backyard. Anything else? Thank you all for coming and thanks so much for supporting my work. It's really cool. <laughs>